Hello, and welcome to the Travel Nursing and Allied Life podcast. I am your host today, Laura Latimer, and we are going to be talking about all the things you want to consider when you're thinking about extending a contract. My name is Laura, and I am the founder of Nomadicare.com. That is a huge resource for travel therapists, a great place to go and compare pay packages, make sure you're getting paid fair, and connect with the companies and the recruiters who are honest. And I've also been on the committee of TravCon for seven years now. TravCon is by far one of my favorite hobbies and side organizations that I work with and try to help grow because TravCon is amazing. It is a big conference that goes on every September and um, has thousands of travelers that show up and hundreds of exhibitors that want to talk to you about travel, healthcare, and hopefully you guys are coming this year. Um, and it's also tons of resources like this podcast. And then I've also was a travel OT for a long time. I started as a new grad in 2009. All right, so let's dive into extensions today. So let's just start with the basics. What is an extension? An extension is essentially just a brand new contract, but for the same facility you're already working for. So typically in travel healthcare, your first contracts are usually 13 weeks. That's the most common. So about three months. And then um, and then the next question is, well, how long is the extension? A lot of times they'll offer you another three months to stay another 13 weeks. But with extensions, they tend to be way more flexible. So if you only want to stay two extra weeks, let's say you get a contract somewhere else and you've got this kind of gap in between you want to fill, you are free to ask to just do two more weeks or four more weeks or six more weeks. Um, whatever it is you want to ask for, great, go for it. And a lot of times the facilities are happy to have you stay as long as you're willing to stay. In a new contract, you are also going to ask for the time off you want. So if you are doing another three months, look ahead, see what time off you need in the next three months and put that in with your extension as well. And then another common question is, are extensions common? If you're a brand new traveler, you might be wondering, is that something I will likely get offered? And yes, they are quite common. And a lot of times facilities will ask if you want to extend and you'll have that option. A few other common questions are, when does extensions usually happen? When could you expect to be asked? And that's usually about halfway through your first contract or halfway through whatever your contract you're in. So maybe a month and a half or two months into your contract, the recruiter might start asking you, do you want to extend? The facility might start saying, please stay longer. And so that's usually about when you'll hear about it and when you need to start deciding. Because at that point, you're either going to start applying for brand new jobs or you can just say, this is going great. I like my coworkers. Let's just stay here for longer and keep it simple. Who initiates the extension? A lot of times it's the facility who will ask for the extension and the recruiter will tell you they are requesting an extension. Would you like to stay or go? But you can initiate as well. You can tell your recruiter, hey, I really like this place. I'm thinking I want to stay longer. Could you reach out to the facility and ask them if they're happy to have me longer and if they're still in need? And a lot of times, as long as you're doing a good job, they would love for you to stay, someone who's trained, who now they can see that they can trust versus bringing on a whole nother traveler. Unless you're only there for just a very specific thing, like covering for someone's maternity leave and that person is coming back or their census has dropped so they don't need you any longer or things like that, they might not say yes. However, they will probably say yes if there is still any need for a traveler at all. And then the last common question um, that we'll dive into a lot deeper on this podcast is, can you negotiate for an extension? Meaning, do you need to keep the same exact pay that you got on the previous one, 
Or now that it's a brand new contract, can you negotiate and try to make more money at the same place? And the answer is yes, you can negotiate. And we're going to dive deeper into that part of the topic because I know that is one of the most interesting parts is how to make more money on an extension. So the question I'm going to talk about first is, should you make more money on an extension? And I think there's a lot of factors that go into this. And the first thing we want to do is go a little bit more big picture and think about where does the money come from um, for an extension. And the thing to realize is that the bill rate usually stays the same. So if you're making more money on an extension than you did at your previous contract, you're pretty much asking the staffing agency, can you guys make less money and give me more money? So depending on how much money you got the first time, there may or may not be room to give you more. But what is important is that you always ask. All of us can survive getting the answer no, but you should always, always ask for more money because that's the very worst thing that could happen is they just say, nope, there's actually no more money to give you on this extension. We are already giving you the most we could possibly give you. Um, and then you can just decide if you want to stay for the same amount or if you don't. But if you don't ask, then you don't even have the option to see if there's more money to be had. Um, if though, on your initial contract, you got some money for your travel cost, let's say they gave you $500 to get from point A to point B to get to that contract. And then after you got that $500, you made your hourly rate and your stipends. Now you're going to do an extension. And a lot of times on extensions, there's not travel reimbursement because you're not traveling from point A to point B, you're already there. And so with that, if they don't find a way to give you that $500 in a different form on the extension, you're essentially making a pay decrease on the extension. The company then will get, the staffing agency will get $500 extra dollars because they're not giving you that money anywhere. So at the very least, I say for extensions, you should always get the money you got the first time. And don't forget about those one-time costs that you got. Your travel reimbursement, maybe they paid for a licensure, things like this. You should say, hey, that was part of the money I made on the first contract. I want that money again so I don't make less money on the second contract. Where else can we put the money? Which we'll get into in just a minute of the different places money might go. Here's one thing to consider, though. Sometimes the bill rate actually goes down. This was really common at the end of the COVID crisis. If you're someone who got a crisis rate and the bill rate was very, very high because they really needed staff, and then at some point the census started dropping, the crisis started tapering out, they dropped the bill rate down to be more at the level of appropriate supply and demand. At that point, a lot of times extensions were offering less money, not even the same money because of that. That is not super typical, but it did happen a lot at the end of COVID. So if you got an exceptional rate the first time because of a crisis or the facility was just very desperate, facilities do sometimes drop a bill rate to go back down closer to what's more normal. So don't be crazy surprised by that if you were making an exceptionally amazing bill rate the first time. Let's just real quick take a reminder of what a bill rate is, especially for our new travelers that are listening, because this is a new concept. It's not like the way we make money when we're permanent employees. Bill rates is a number that's going to be different from facility to facility, from season to season, from location to location. So there's no such thing as one set bill rate. But in this example, as we're learning about bill rates, let's pretend like the bill rate is $100 an hour. What that means is the hospital is going to pay $100 an hour for every hour that you work. The staffing agency will get that $100 and it is intended for the staffing agency to take part of it to pay for their costs of doing business and take part of it to pay us 
as the traveler. Usually us as the travelers do not get to know what the bill rate is. So for some facilities, it might be 100. Another location, it could be 150. Another one, it could be $75 an hour. Huge range. And we don't get to see what that bill rate is. That's why it can feel like a bit of a game, like a poker game where we can't see the other person's cards when we're trying to negotiate and find out what is fair pay based on what this facility is willing to pay for the bill rate. Today, job boards have made that much easier for us to look at job boards and see what multiple agencies are offering to pay us for our pay. And it makes it easier for a staffing agency to not take too much of that bill rate because it would be pretty obvious when we start comparing jobs on these public job boards. Now for an extension, if the bill rate for an extension is $100 an hour, just like it was for the first contract, that means there isn't suddenly extra money. It's not like you get a raise for every extension based on the bill rate. So if you're doing a split and the first time the staffing agency took 30% of the bill rate and they gave you, let's say, 70% of it, now for the extension, maybe you're saying, hey, this time I only want you to take 25%. I want you as a staffing agency to make less money and I want you to give me more. So sometimes the negotiation is about asking the staffing agency to make less money for you to make more money. It's not typically about the bill rate going up. However, it's not necessarily unreasonable for you to ask to make more and for them to get a bit less because for the extensions, the staffing agencies really aren't doing that much work. They're doing a lot less work, a lot of the cost of marketing and things like that, onboarding, credentialing are already paid for. So they're just such a dream. They're so easy for staffing agencies. So you could say that, hey, I know you guys aren't credentialing me this time. We've had some trust built in. I didn't call in for a lot of sick days the first time around. I want a raise from y'all's cut. I want to get a little bit more money. Um, sometimes they'll say yes. And sometimes they'll say no. And since you don't know what the bill rate is, maybe for the first contract, they actually paid you a big chunk of the bill rate and they didn't keep that much for themselves already. So maybe they really just don't have that much buffer, but maybe they do. So always, always ask for more money. Worst that can happen is no. Next thing I would like to talk about is where can the extra money go? So let's say the staffing agency said, yes, you know what? We're going to give you an extra $1,000 bonus for your extension. Now, you might say, great, I would like that money to be tax-free money, but it might not be able to go into tax-free buckets of money. And let me explain why. Staffing agencies should have legal and tax advisors that dictate where they can put money safely without the IRS thinking they're re recharacterizing wages or they're trying to avoid taxes. So each staffing agency should have a protocol for if we're giving someone more money for extensions, it can go into these buckets. Typically, that means they're not going to put money or they shouldn't put money in your tax-free stipends. The stipends are the money you get for your meals and incidentals and for your housing. And that's because if you just think about it logically and you're pretending that you're the IRS trying to make sure that there's not tax evasion going on and that everyone is paying fair taxes, typically, logically, it doesn't make sense for my cost of my housing to go up just because I extended. I'm still in the same house, most likely in the same zip code and cost of living area. So how can the staffing agency justify suddenly giving me more money for housing that's tax free without having a good logical reason for, well, now housing costs more. The exception for this is going to be if you are working in a place where the cost of living does go up seasonally and you're suddenly in a new season. Then they have a true justification of why you need more money for housing if you go into the tourist season or something like that. But typically there's not a good logical reason. So they're not gonna be able to just give you more tax-free money in your stipends. 
So that means they can either give you a bonus. Maybe they say, cool, at the end of your extension, we'll give you $1,000 or we'll give you 500 up front and 500 at the end when you've completed it. Or um, maybe they'll increase your taxable part of your paycheck. And so you get more per hour on the wage part, not the stipend part. So you'll owe taxes on that. Or they could try to find ways to give you tax-free money. They might see if you're going to take a trip home and back during this extension, and then they could give you another travel reimbursement, perhaps. Um, or if there's a big CEU course or something that is logical for business that they can make a tax write-off for you, maybe they'll give you money to go towards reimbursing you for something like that. So there's different rules for where money can go. Different staffing agencies might have different rules from one another because in our industry, the tax rules and the legal rules are more in the gray area, not in the black and white area. So sometimes one tax advisor will interpret what the words are from the IRS to a different tax advisor, or one company might be a little bit more cautious and do things by the book more, and someone else might be a little bit more on the edge and living a little bit more dangerously for if they got audited. So those are places that you could expect extra money to go for extensions. The next common question is how long can you extend for? The tax experts in our industry say that if you want to keep those perks of being a traveler where you get the tax-free stipends, then you essentially have to be a real traveler and you have to keep on traveling. So the rule that they say is you can't stay in one commutable place, so pretty much one region that you could drive to, for more than 12 months in a 24-month period. So just one year out of every two years. So that means if you've worked a 13-week assignment, you could extend three more times until you get to that 12-month mark. And if you keep working over that mark, that location, that whole region that's drivable becomes your tax home. Because the IRS is going to say, you're no longer a traveler. You're just a normal worker. You just live somewhere. You're not moving. So we want to get tax money from you. We no longer want to give you these tax benefits. And so that will become your tax home. And if you keep going, you need to pay taxes on all of the money you make and no longer get stipends. Or you could extend, you know, up to three times and then, or up to one year, and then you need to move far enough away that it's not commutable and you need to stay far enough away for 12 months, a whole year before you go back to that region. If you don't want that region to become your tax home. And lastly, I want to talk about if you can switch agencies when you extend. Sometimes maybe you worked a contract and during that contract you thought, ooh, I would rather work with this other agency. I am not enjoying my time here. This is a similar thing of you can always ask and you can always try. It might be a no and it might be a yes. And that depends on many things. The first thing is going to be the contractual obligations that you have. When you signed a contract with that staffing agency, sometimes there's things in the contract that stipulate, stipulate that you can't switch to a new agency at the same facility for a certain amount of time. If they found that job for you, then you're going to work that job for them only for however long. Is that enforceable in court? Is that one of those non-compete things that doesn't hold up in certain states, but it does hold up in other states? I'm not sure. That legal part of it, I don't know. Uh, but it could be really hard probably to determine going to courts, trying to figure that out. But that is something to just consider. Looking at your contract and seeing, did I sign off and agree that I would stay with this agency if I'm working this contract? Two, the agreements on that you can't see between the staffing agency and the hospital. Do they have some kind of agreement that tells the hospital, if we find you a traveler and we do the work to credential them and they work for you, you can't then just switch and let some other staffing agency 
take over that traveler. So maybe they have an agreement in the back end where the hospital will say, no, you can't switch. We actually aren't allowed to switch you. Again, is that legally binding for them on the back end? I don't know. Um, me personally, I don't know how how much non-competes are held up in court, but it might give it a little bit more friction to make it hard if they have it in contracts that we're signing. Another reason is just admin headaches. Sometimes the VMSs or the hospitals just don't want you to switch because it's just inconvenient. You're already set up with that staffing agency, all the credentialing, all the paperwork, the T's crossed, the I's dotted. It's already been done and taken care of with someone else. So sometimes they just say, look, we don't want to deal with that. You guys have to deal with it yourself and negotiate and figure out how to make it work, but we don't want this traveler to switch. Um, and then the other thing I'll say is if you do want to switch, just do it professionally. You don't want to burn a bridge because once you start going down that road of wanting to switch, you want to make make it where if the hospital ends up saying no or something comes up, that you can still go back to that original agency and it not be overly awkward. So just be clear about why you want to switch. This agency is willing to pay me a lot more money, um, whatever your reason is, or I had a really hard, bad time with my recruiter and I've lost some trust, whatever it is, just be really clear about it in a professional way, in a way that allows for dialogue and allows for professionalism. Be honest about your reasons and just be fair about it too. Try not to steal contracts from one agency and bring them to another agency and kind of play that back end. Just try to be fair about the situation and be, and be professional and as kind as you can in that situation. And hopefully they'll just let you do your wishes. That's the hope. But then if switch, switching is not an option and for some reason they say no, great, you tried you were professional, you didn't burn a bridge, and now you can just make the best decision for yourself. You can decide if even though you can't switch, is it worth it just to stay with the other agency because you loved the contract, you loved your coworkers, the pay was great, you're having trouble finding another job somewhere else you want to go, it's just easier to not find more housing. Or you might say, no, I am done with that agency I'm, if I can't switch, I'm choosing to leave and then I can go with another agency with another job, but then you can have, you can ask professionally, see what they say, and then make the best decision for yourself. And sometimes it's yes. Sometimes hospitals are like, we don't care. We like you, the, tr the traveler work with whoever you want and you let us know. But sometimes it is a no. And they say, we can't, we can't do that. So just be open to either of them might happening. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you learned a lot about extensions and I hope this helps you make more money, feel more empowered when you are extending next time. And I will hopefully see you at TravCon this year. And if you're not already subscribed, subscribe to this podcast. We have so much great content that comes out of this podcast and this YouTube channel. And I'll see you next time. Bye.